Hello. Hi. My name is Sarah Cahill, and it's very exciting to be here for the Gospel of Mary Magdalene by Mark Adamo. This opera has been five years in the making and involved a tremendous amount of research and scholarship. Adamo used a number of sources, including the New Testament, which is best known to us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also the so-called Gnostic Gospels, which were discovered in Egypt in 1945, as well as the Gospel of Mary, which turned up in 1896 in a bazaar in Cairo. These books give Mary Magdalene a central place of honor in Jesus' circle, and um, among the all-male group of disciples which we know from the New Testament. Mary witnesses the crucifixion, that's in the New Testament. She is the first to discover Christ, uh, has ri risen from the grave. She delivers the news to the apostles. And she was known to have been a, an independent, single woman, could well have been a very powerful influence on Yeshua, which she is in this opera, and a spiritual leader in her own right. This is the vision of Mary Magdalene, which Mark Adamo focuses on. The image of her as a repentant prostitute, uh, as she is portrayed in Christian iconography, is really a fallacy of mistaken identity that came much, much later in the Catholic Church. And that was a wrong-headed notion that was carried over and became familiar. Um, it, a lot of great paintings have Mary Magdalene as a as a prostitute and um, sort of fallen woman. So Mark Adamo was interested in how these alternative gospels present us with a very different picture of the story of Christ and what they tell us about the role of women, the place of believers who have been traditionally marginalized by Catholicism. So it's easy to understand why these books were um, banned by the church for several centuries only recently discovered. It's a courageous work, this opera that you're about to hear, and it's also a very intimate work. Much of the real action happens internally, as the four main characters, who are Mary Magdalene, Yeshua, uh, who is Jesus, Miriam, who is Mary, Jesus' mother, and Peter, they try to, throughout the opera, they try to resolve the conflicts and contradictions of their faith, and they also transform one another. They're presented not as saints, but as flawed human beings. And in this sense, I think this is a very personal work for Mark Adamo, composer and librettist of this opera, who has talked about how, as a gay man and the son of a divorced woman, he felt the Catholic Church excluded many of its followers and asked them to renounce their true selves and try to be somebody else. Um, of course, the narrative is familiar. We already know it's going to end badly for Jesus, um, who is again called Yeshua in this opera. And so at the same time, you've got this huge philosophical um, issue, this crisis of faith, which speaks to our deepest spiritual values. And at the same time, we have a compelling love story between Mary Magdalene and Yeshua. They teach each other, they guide each other, and in some ways, they complete each other. When the curtain rises, you see a group dressed in modern clothes. The score reads, the time is now, the place is Galilee, the first century CE. And these people basically stand in for you and me. They're seen throughout the opera overlooking the action. And they also stand in for Mark Adamo, um, us reading the Bible today, struggling with it, trying to find meaning in our modern lives um, and meaning which embraces all of us. They're, uh, these seekers, they're called, are about to burn their Bibles until the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is put into their hands, and they say, they ask, who was she? Almost willing her to materialize. This leads right into her opening solo, and when she sings, you bring me to life, she's singing to the seekers who will her to exist. She's singing to us in the audience. She's also hinting at the resurrection, which is going to close the opera, you bring me to life. Um, so these, these bringing to life scenes sort of bookend the opera. And then after that, it, became, it becomes gradually clear that she's actually singing to a man in bed. Um, this is not, there's a little confusion. This is not Yeshua who's in bed. This is a man named Simon, a married man, and his wife is going to enter the scene soon. So um, let's listen 
to a little of the seekers first. These are the people in modern dress who open the opera, and then leading into Mary Magdalene's solo. Example one, please. <laughs> So Mary Magdalene, from the very beginning, projects confidence and strength and sensuality, um, all in the wondrous voice of Sasha Cook, who is making her um, San Francisco opera debut. But she's also restless and searching for some spiritual meaning, which she recognizes uh, when she meets Yeshua. Just a little about the set. It's there for the entire performance. It functions as archaeological dig as a place for discovery. It exists on several levels, so it allows the chorus, the wonderful chorus, um, to uh, be on the, uh, on the top of the um, set and um, witness the action below. Stairs on both sides. It also functions as a kind of acoustical shell and allows the modern seekers also to witness the action from different points of view. So they're there in modern dress um, throughout the opera. The next musical example we'll hear is more turbulent musically. It's between Mary Magdalene and Yeshua. He's just found out that John the Baptist has been beheaded. He feels responsible, and uh, Peter, his, his main disciple, wants to get revenge. Yeshua considers it, and Mary Magdalene argues, live by the sword, die by the sword. She comforts him, and this is their real coming together. This is a turning point for everyone. It's clear that he and Peter have always thought alike. And now Mary Magdalene is disrupting that relationship. She's also transforming the teaching of Yeshua. So by the second act, he'll start preaching about um, love and peace, which is exactly what Peter does not want. Peter wants him to um, uh, go and make trouble in Rome. So here is the scene, the, the, um, the scene between Mary, uh, Yeshua and Mary Magdalene. We shall avenge him. We shall storm Achilles and avenge him. And we that bring him back to life. Live by the sword. Die by the sword. I should have saved him. Misery. I abandoned him. He ordered you to run from him. I left him.
that's, I, I'm, I'm sorry I cut it off there because there's, there's this, all through the opera, there's this look at me, there's this recognition and look, you know, really look at me, stop what you're doing, look at me, it's, it's beautiful. Um, there are some kind of recurring motifs, musical motifs, and also, um, also um, in the libretto, which, which I'll talk about. I want to talk a little bit about the intimacy of this opera. And as I mentioned, a lot of the action is internal, which is reflected in the music, I think. It beautifully depicts the emotional states of the characters. It, as you just heard, this turbulence below Yeshua's kind of term, in, internal turmoil about um, his friend who has just been beheaded. And um, so when some, someone is anxious or disturbed, the orchestra sort of roils up. There's um, these romantic surges of full strings and winds. And in contrast, during moments of serenity, the best moments between Yeshua and Mary Magdalene um, are moments of real peace. And it's like chamber music with just one or two solo instruments supporting the voice. There's a real purity in the scoring. So listen to that, how the, the, the music really shifts according to what's happening inside, um, inside the, the characters, the four main characters in the opera. And that gets heightened as the opera goes on, even in the most dramatic moments, including the resurrection at the end. Um, there's a kind of quietude. There's no kind of big Cecil B. DeMille dramatic approach. It's on a very intimate human scale. And it's been interesting to read the reviews of this opera, how often adjectives like shimmering or luminous or are used. Uh, that, that radiant sound um, in the orchestra conveys the spiritual transformation of the characters. There are some surprises in this opera, like the love affair and wedding of Mary and Yeshua. Um, but the entire libretto, I want to say, is taken from either the canonical or Gnostic Gospels, uh, and also from 50 years of New Testament scholarship. So everything you hear and see is supported by um, um, one, of, one, of these, one of these Gospels, the alternate, uh, alternative Gospels or the New Testament that we know. Um, there's a purpose for everything in the opera. Um, the libretto has lots and lots of footnotes saying this is, this is where this comes from, this is where this comes from. So very little of it is, is just comes out of, um, is made up. Um, one, another surprise is the role of Miriam, otherwise known as Mary. She's not the virgin mother and there's no virgin birth in this opera. She feels tremendously guilty because she got pregnant when she was 15 and then, uh, and then married a man who was not the father of her child. I think everybody's waiting for big riots and protests outside, but maybe they're to come. Um, and she feels that this, this event in her life has injured her son, Yeshua, sort of tainted him. Um, because he's called a bastard to his face, you'll see that, you'll see some of his friends saying, you know, bastard and sort of joking. Um, he scorns his mother and is ashamed of her. And at first, Miriam is skeptical of Mary Magdalene, but then as she grows to trust and respect her, they gravitate towards one another, as they do in some of the great iconic works of art. You see them uh, together at the foot of the cross, and they're, they're sort of like mirror images of each other um, at the crucifixion, and that's, that's the way they are here. Miriam also seems transformed through the course of the opera by Mary Magdalene. Let's listen to a duet. This is when Miriam is getting Mary Magdalene ready for her wedding to Yeshua. Um, and again, listen to, the, listen to the score. Miriam is singing Ah to weave around Mary Magdalene's lines with a beautiful filigree accompaniment. <laughs>
There's one other important main character who is Peter, and I didn't include him in these musical excerpts, but during the performance you might notice that often his vocal writing is uh, more um, angular and abrupt, more in fits and starts than the naturally flowing lines of Mary Magdalene and Yeshua. And again, I think the music, the, uh, music very much reflects the um, interior goings on of the um, character. Peter is Yeshua's main disciple. They've been very close. Uh, mutual love and trust are important. They ask each other often, uh, do you love me? Do you, um, you know, do you, do you trust me? Peter is encouraging Yeshua to revolt against Rome, but Mary Magdalene objects that violence just leads to more violence, the uh, live by the sword, die by the sword idea. And as Act Two proceeds, Peter becomes more of a lost soul, plagued by guilt at turning against his friend and denying his faith. And to me, he seems to represent the more conservative elements in any religion, any kind of fundamentalism, and any rigidly literal reading of a sacred text which doesn't allow for another viewpoint. And that's why the biggest conflict is between him and Mary Magdalene, who as a powerful woman threatens him. He really doesn't like powerful women. And it's interesting that uh, Yeshua can transform, but then um, uh, Peter says, there's, there's, at the very end of Act One, he's, he's reminding him, you said this, you said this, you said we shouldn't allow women, you said this. He's reminding him, but there's no room for, um, there's no room for change in his vision. It's sort of like if you said this once, you can't change your mind. And so um, they're very much in contrast to each other, that Yeshua can um, transform spiritually, emotionally, internally, and Peter just can't. Um, Adamo's libretto borrows from a number of sources. Central among them is the Gospel of Mary, um, which has uh, this line. Peter, in the Gospel of Mary, Peter questioned the other disciples about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? And so that's just one example of how Mark Adamo has, has um, supported everything in the libretto with something from either the Gnostic Gospels or the New Testament. Um, but Mary Magdalene is just asking to be given fair consideration and treated like an equal. And she's certainly an intellectual equal and a spiritual equal. And Adamo seems to question why that's such a radical notion in our society. We'll listen to the opening of Act Two, Scene Three, with Mary Magdalene and Yeshua on the morning that he's going to be taken away and crucified. She knows what's about to happen, and Adamo's stage directions read that as she anoints him, quote, she is at once making love to him a final time and dressing him for burial, unquote. And this opening echoes the earlier romantic love scene when they're in bed, which also begins, I love this time of morning, and in this case, it's in past tense, I loved this time of morning. During the solo, Yeshua is with her, but he's silent. And again, the orchestral writing is sparse, just supporting the intimacy of the solo voice. She sings, this is how I lose you. This is how it ends, early on an ordinary day.
You know, it's so hard to fade that out. It's so beautiful. Um, one last excerpt. This is the tomb with Yeshua's body. And in this version, his ghost appears. Um, he doesn't, it's different from the image we have of him rising from the dead, uh, where he just sort of disappears, his body isn't there. Um, she's facing his body, the ghost is behind her, and um, he, he sings to her, tell them what we did, tell them what we tried for, passing on the responsibility for his legacy to Mary Magdalene, and he places his crown of thorns on her head, and she walks upward to sunlight um, and to Miriam, and um, it's her responsibility then to tell, um, to tell what, he, what he says in this scene. So. So that's uh, Nathan Gunn as Yeshua. It's really an incredible scene. Um, but again, it's just, it's very gentle. It's not like this big explosive sort of, you know, melodramatic um, um, resurrection scene. Couple of things to say. Um, there's no synopsis in the program book. So if you would like a synopsis, you can download it from the Mary Magdalene page on the website sfopera.com slash Magdalene. And also, after the uh, performance tonight, please join cultural historian and mythologist Kayleen Asbo for a uh, discussion immediately following the performance, and that's going to be in the cafe at the opera in the lower lobby. Thank you. <laughs>